Q&A session. So, Professor Mayor, we have picked up a few questions from the Q&A box and I'll just run those questions for you. So, we'll start with the first question. So, we have, uh, so one of the attendees asking, uh, Professor Mayor, how the distance between halide and metal site affect the electron transfer? Oh, that's a really good question. And it's one that it comes up a lot in the uh, kinetic analysis. Um, in the semi-classical Marcus expression, the electronic coupling matrix element is squared. So the coupling is really important uh, in determining the kinetics. And one of the issues therefore that haunts theoretical and experimental approaches to electron transfer is what is the real distance? How far away are things and how close? Because there's this very strong dependence on kinetics. And one way to solve that question is what we showed with the donor uh, pi acceptor complexes, the Berlinguet type molecules, where you have a covalent bridge. But even there, the bridge has some flexibility and if there's strong coupling, the site of the nitrogen and the ruthenium is just the geometric distance. The molecular orbitals extend beyond that. We can't covalently link the halide to the semiconductor or to the, the dye molecule. We can hydrogen bond it, as I showed you, or we can electrostatically bond it. So it's even more challenging for us. So this is a very long-winded way of saying, we don't know in general, how far apart the halide is from the redox center. By our NMR studies, we believe they're contact ion pairs. In other words, we don't think there's any solvent between the halide and the sensitizer. So we think we're at the van der Waals radius. Um, otherwise, we don't think we'd see those strong upfield shifts in the uh, hydrogen resonances of our complexes. So we think they're contact ion pairs and we use the van der Waals radii. So Shannon's uh, ionic radii and that of the, to get an idea of the charge transfer distance, but in precise detail, we don't really know. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Mayor. So moving on to the next question, it's somewhat related to the previous one. And I think mm -hmm. the explanation might have helped the audience in understanding this particular question also. So it's what will be the role of co-sensitization in halide photoredox chemistry in DSSC? That's a very good question. And I didn't touch on that, um, but you know, very early on, uh, the idea was to use one sensitizer. So a panchromatic light absorber that would harvest all the light and do, and then, uh, you know, not too much longer, say in the mid nineties, the idea of using what they often called a cocktail, a mixture of different dyes so that you weren't putting such a burden on each individual dye. And there are challenges with that. Uh, sometimes the dyes interact with one another and in an inefficient way, but the highest efficiencies that I'm aware of now are for a porphyrin sensitizer with a bis isothiocyanate dye. I should say the highest confirmed efficiencies I'm aware of. So right now, uh, the state of the art has two dyes on the surface and I can imagine that that will continue. The reality is for practical applications, we're kind of stuck with iodide still um, in terms of practical application. So if we can, start absorbing further to the red, um, into the near infrared region, say beyond a thousand nanometers, uh, we have a chance to push the efficiencies up above 15% and become more competitive with silicon photovoltaics. And it's very hard to imagine one dye molecule that would absorb from 400 out to 1100, like silicon materials do, for example. So I suspect uh, that when there are breakthroughs for practical applications, we will see multiple dyes 
as a way to realize that. Thank you, Professor Boyer. Uh, we have the next question. What about your acceptabilities of thermoelectric, pyroelectric, and piezoelectric energy harvesting areas? So this is somewhat related to the journal. Uh, yeah. Acceptance and interest in these areas. That's great. I'm really glad that question came up. Uh, in part because for thermoelectric materials, uh, we have an outstanding associate and, and soon to be executive editor uh, in Bangalore, um, uh, Kanishka uh, Biswa. And Kanishka is an expert in thermoelectric materials. And we've had a special forum issue appear in thermoelectrics just uh, this past year that we're very excited about. Um, we also teamed up with ACS Applied Materials and Interface and had a virtual issue on thermoelectrics. And for uh, you know, waste heat energy that's generated in different conditions, uh, using that on the spot to generate electrical power, there are some really exciting applications. Um, in terms of the piezoelectric generators, um, that is a very... Uh, the, the amount of power that's generated there is very, very small. And one of our sister journals, ACS Applied um, Electronic Materials is a better fit for that because very often in electronic devices or something you might wear on your skin, um, the small amount of energy you can get from a nano generator and energy harvesting is sufficient for that. They're not as good a match for our journal, which is generally looking at higher energy applications. So if you're looking at piezoelectrics or nano generators, I would suggest you submit your work to ACS Applied Electronic Materials. If you're looking at thermoelectrics or photovoltaics or batteries or capacitors, those are better matches for our journal, ACS Applied Energy Materials. Thank you, Professor Mayor, for clarifying in a wonderful way. So we have the next question. So how does the dye regeneration occurs in dye sensitized catalysts? Example, dye sensitized in TiO2 nanoparticles system for wastewater treatment application, et cetera. Yes. You know, it's a really good question. And I think the literature is still a little unclear about it. My own view is that what happens at a dye sensitized interface is after the dye injects an electron, the oxidized dye generates an iodine atom. And that atom reacts with iodide to form a species we call diiodide. It's also the iodine radical anion, I2 minus dye. That molecule has a huge free energy change for disproportionation. It's a disproportionation-like reaction. Two diiodides come together and they make triiodide and iodide. And an advantage of that disproportionation reaction is that triiodide and iodide are not easily reduced by the injected electrons in TiO2. And that's what allows those redox mediators to get away to the platinum electrode where they get regenerated. It's very rare for a interpenetrating network type solar cell. And I think the dye sensitized was the first example of that really, to not have a lot of back electron transfer. Why don't the injected electrons recombine to triiodide? Well, that one electron potential is actually thermodynamically uphill. Now, the reason I say it's a little contentious is that there are review articles written that say you can go directly to diiodide. Once you inject an electron, the oxidized sensitizer takes two iodides and in one concerted step makes the iodine radical anion or what we call diiodide. And we've looked really, really hard for that. There are certainly interfaces and things where we can't tell it's too fast, but we've never seen any clear evidence. So I think it goes one electron at a time. And that's generally what light driven reactions do. It's why we in the photochemistry field get really excited when we find conditions where we can drive multi electron reactions with light. Usually, a, a dye molecule, or it'd be the same if you're exciting a semiconductor, once you create that excited state, you make something that's a stronger reducing agent, 
and a stronger oxidizing agent than the ground state, but it only drives the reactions one at a time. And unfortunately for fuel forming and other reactions, water oxidation, water splitting, um, we want to drive multi-electron transfers. And that's why we need often to introduce catalysts. Yeah, so thank you, Professor Mayer. So again, we have a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, I'll take, if you allow, I'll take the last question. Oh, we can, we can go, because I was a little long in my talk, as long as the ACS is fine, I'm... So we can no take a couple of questions. questions. So uh, sure. there's, uh, there's one question from the attendee. He wants to know about molecular, he or she wants to know about the molecular dipoles. Is there any direct relationship with the reactivity of the molecule? That's a really, really good question. I'll tell you, early in my career, I was very suspicious of the reports that the dipoles were important. You know, electric fields at interfaces, uh, to me, the charged ions, the lithium and the lithium iodide, the iodide anion, the injected electron, those were what were gonna really control the fields. And I thought the dipoles would be smaller. Um, but we have run into cases where the only way we can explain changes in open circuit voltages are to look at the dipole of the dye, and they definitely have an, inter, uh, an impact. And in the case I showed where the dye molecules flip over, um, you know, there's a case where there has, the molecule has to be weakly bound to begin with. If it's a strong surface linkage, then the field can orient it, but you'll never overcome the Zeeman energy to, to flip it. Uh, but if it's already uh, got some torque, then you can flip it over. And, you know, we've seen that now for several different molecules, and we think we might be able to exploit that. So I don't think you're going to get hundreds of millivolts in a dye-sensitized solar cell out of orienting dipoles. Uh, but David Kahan and Israel and others have, have shown that the effects can be larger than you'd think. Um, so I'm keeping an open mind to it. And I do think that's an interesting area to look at. And, you know, another last example, I know we're short on time, but are in the porphyrins that I mentioned, you know, very early on, uh, porphyrins were horrible dye sensitizers. They just didn't work very well. And then synthetic chemists started making them so that you could get a net dipole or vectoral charge transfer toward the interface. Uh, by using a means and only one functional binding group to orient the dyes, and suddenly the efficiencies went up markedly. So the dipole is certainly important at these interfaces. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Mayer. So you just uh, talked about uh, using porphyrins as a dye sensitizer. So there is one question relating to it. What is the feasibility or challenge of making a stable chlorophyll pigment as sensitizer on TiO2 nanoparticles for wastewater treatment? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And stability in any molecular approach that involves solar energy is always a challenge. Um, you know, our approach here is to use molecules and it's one that we often encounter and sunlight is harsh uh, and it gets hot. Uh, so we need thermal and photochemical stability. In my own uh, understanding of uh, organic molecules, porphyrins and chlorophylls and macrocycles of that type are remarkably stable. And in the dye sensitized solar cell field, we haven't done them personally in our own labs, uh, but the Gretzel labs in Switzerland and in others have done accelerated testing to show that these molecules can undergo um, thousands of cycles and have lifetimes of a solar cell that would be up in the 10 year region. Now those are regenerative solar cells that are oxidizing iodide. For other applications where water oxidation, uh, those types, uh, it's much less clear whether we can stabilize the molecules. And I'll just give one example. For water oxidation, we've been finding that we can put a very thin layer of the oxide on top of the molecules using atomic layer deposition typically. And surprisingly, it doesn't shut off the catalysis. The layer is thin enough and porous enough that molecules can get in and out 
and the stability improves. It's still not a stability that's practically useful, but at least gives us some hope that with continued fundamental study, we could realize that. 